Cyril Warmonger. You know, there's an awful lot of nonsense written on the internet about how the world is run by lizards. I ask you. I've just been appointed the head of the World Bank, and I'm shortly also to become the Secretary General of NATO and the head of the EU Commission. So you can see what a load of nonsense this lizard stuff really is, can't you? Sorry, mate. Lizards may or may not rule the world, but they don't present Sputnik. My name is Neil Clark, and I'm not a lizard. And I am presenting Sputnik for my good friends George and Gatry. This week, it gives me great pleasure to introduce a very special guest to the programme. He's the man who, for over 50 years, has been defying the establishment gatekeepers to tell us the truth about what's really going on in the world. He's reported from war zones from Vietnam to Iraq and produced several award-winning films the latest being The Coming War on China. He's my journalistic hero, and I expect he's yours too. He is Mr John Pilger. John, a very warm welcome Thank on board you, the Sputnik. Neil. Thank very you so much for coming on. John, where should we start? Should we start talking about the events of the UK general election? You've, you okay. started on Fleet Street, didn't you, in 62? I did. Have you seen anything as extraordinary as what happened last week? No, I suppose um, I remember... <laughs> Harold Wilson coming to power, but that was kind of expected. Mm. You know, they, yeah. they, it was ready, 13 years of Tory rule, misrule, as they mm. called it. But uh, this Jeremy Corbyn achievement, not quite a win, but mm. certainly a triumph, uh, is wonderful on so many levels because it it has, has proven all the... The, the forces that range against the most moderate, the most modest opposition mm. to extreme policies in this country, it has proved that uh, they're, they're, they're wrong. When you think of all those thousands of students that registered at the last minute yep. and the numbers that have joined the Labour Party and have since joined the Labour Party, it's beyond the Labour Party in a sense. Mm. It's a rebellion. And just in, in the same way, though not exactly the same, of course, the Brexit vote was right. a rebellion mm. and, and not painted as it has been since then. But this was uh, a full-throated roar. There's mm. no question about that. Uh, and it will be very interesting to see what happens this year with another election. I understand Jeremy Corbyn thinks there will be an election uh, mm. in September or October. I, mm. I read that he told uh, mm. somebody on his allotment that was what he thought. Yeah. I don't know. I would guess, and I'm not a futurist and I hesitate, but I would guess anyway, that he would win then. Mm, That's absolutely. extraordinary. Yeah, and I think one angle of this is the way there was this people defying the, what I call the gatekeepers, you know, the establishment gatekeepers who told us ad nauseum, you know, don't vote for this man, yeah. he's a pariah. He's a terrorist sympathiser, you name it, he was it. And yet 40% of the voters still went out there and basically stuck two so fingers up. That's so all so absurd. Mm. And, you know, this is a sophisticated society. Mm. It was so absurd calling Jeremy Corbyn, giving him that kind of level of abuse. Um, you know, so it backfired, it, you're saying, really? It, it's yeah. back, backfired. Yeah. I think it's... I actually think it's the end of the power of the, the tabloids that have crowed that they actually were kingmakers. Mm. Well, Rupert Murdoch actually said, didn't he, boasted that yes. no prime minister that he didn't support had been elected. Yes. Since, I think... I think, 74, I think 1974. I th I'm, I'm pretty sure that's over. Mm. It's so heartening that they could really say anything about Jeremy Corbyn, and they almost did. Oh, yes. And... 
he, he, his supporters would ignore it. A lot has to do with the whole change in, in particularly in young people's media habits, as it were. Mm. They're, uh, they're social media creatures now, yep. uh, most of them. Newspapers have made themselves, in many respects, defunct. They're not. Actually, people... Newspapers as such, people actually quite like. They like the visceral idea of the newspaper. It, it's like books. It, mm. it appeals right across the generations. But newspapers, playing this extraordinary propaganda card, have really destroyed their own power mm. uh, at election time in this country. It's, it's quite wondrous to behold, But actually. they've become newspapers, haven't they, really, compared to when you... First yeah. started in the 60s, we yes. had the comment page, didn't we? Yes. And then, but with the rest of the paper was object, more or less pretty objective news. They've gone the other way around now, hasn't it? And it's, it's just sort of opinion and news, uh, views rather, dominate. Views dominate. That's... Mm -hmm. uh, the reporter is not as celebrated... The great reporter mm -hmm. is not as celebrated as the great windbag. Yes, right. well... Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> what we have is a whole... If you take The Guardian, a whole... Mm -hmm. Uh, stable of precocious windbags. <laughs> Great reporting is quite different. Mm. Great reporting that draws conclusions, that seeks the truth mm. through evidence, yeah. uh, and being the voice from the bottom, not from the top, being an mm. agent of people, not an agent of power. Mm. That kind of idea of journalism, that is... that It exists in honourable exceptions mm. in the so-called mainstream media. But that's really what we're missing, and that's why they got it so wrong. Mm. You wrote a wonderful piece, which I love, in 2014, called The Return of George Orwell. Let me just quote from this. You said that, when I began a career in Britain's Fleet Street in the 1960s, it was acceptable to critique Western power as a rapacious force. And you quoted, of course, the great James Cameron, the reporter who reported on the war in Korea and the American bombing of North Vietnam. And you said that, contrasted today, that dissent in politics, as in journalism and the arts, it seems that dissent, once tolerated in the mainstream, has regressed to a dissidence, a metaphor mm. underground, in the mm. way that basically you could, you know, there was more space to critique Western power yes, uh, in, in the 60s and 70s than there is now. Yes, there were always gatekeepers, and mm. the press was always conservative, and the press always represented vested interests. Mm. Uh, but uh, Beaverbrook Standard could employ the likes of James Cameron. Mm. Uh, and my own career on the Mirror, uh, which was solidly on the right of the Labour Party most mm. of the time, right. um, I think said so something about that. It's, it's, it, it, it pushed dissenting journalism, which is one definition of real journalism, because why have journalism at all if it is not going to dissent from the received wisdom, if it's right. not going to find out, if it's not going to push down mm. facades and, 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 and lift rocks and find out? Mm. That's journalism. It doesn't mm. have to be aligned with any political party, but it, it, it does have to be a dissenter. Mm. So when you destroy that whole notion of journalism as a, as a dissenter and make the, the media simply uh, a foghorn right, yeah. uh, for whatever establishment received wisdom yeah. is, uh, is out there, uh, as it largely has become, it's divided into factions, of mm. course. You have the, the traditional Tory right in the, in the Telegraph. You have yeah. the Murdoch right in the Times. You have the liberal right and the Guardian and so on. Mm. Um, but it's not, that's not, just that, that is not journalism as such. It's a, it's a, it's a form of, of um, it's a form of propaganda, mm. as we saw in this election campaign. Mm. And they all agree, don't they, on, on big issues, a couple of issues I think they all agree on, is Russia, the demonisation of Russia, and also the demonisation of Julian Assange. Yeah, well, the demo, issues, yeah. I mean, the creation of a second Cold War mm. is a wonder to behold. Mm. It is such a nonsense. Mm. 
every bit about it is nonsense. In the United States, not as bad here, mm. uh, uh, in the, the United States, there's a kind of hysteria mm. now. Yeah. Um, and this, this uh, congressional committee that is hearing the likes of uh, James Comey, the former head of America's political police, yeah. the FBI, as an objective witness. Yeah. <laughs> this is the FBI, which was run by J. Edgar Hoover all that time. Right. He tried to smear everyone on Earth. The, yeah. it, it, the, there, is, there, is, there is no evidence, none whatsoever. Even the idea that Russia has interfered in the election. How did it change the election? What mm. ballots were changed? Mm. How did it get into those boxes? Yeah. What states didn't vote mm. um, for, uh, for the candidate uh, that should have won uh, because of Russian interference? Mm. The whole thing is nonsense. Mm. And yet the, you have newspapers, so-called newspapers of record, like the New York Times, saying, in effect, the Russians are coming. Mm. Uh, Comey himself said, uh, which was reported widely across <laughs> the US in the last couple of days, they're coming to get America. I think I quote yeah. him exactly. Yeah. I mean, in a so-called information age, which really is not so much an information age as a media age, to have this, this tsunami of propaganda mm. about Russia and about the Russian president, uh, the distortion of facts, the invasions that don't happen. Mm. Um, you, you know, you, you are we living in a kind of, it's a sort of almost a, a virtual fantasy world, mm. in a sense, if you rely on the so-called mainstream media, and I don't like that term because it's, it's really an extreme mm. propaganda, actually. Mainstream suggests for me, the kind of people who voted for Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> but, yes, it's uh, Orwellian, isn't it? The real yeah, yeah, it's the opposite, Orwellian. Yeah. It's a term that, that we should mentally put in inverted commas mm. all the time. Mm. Um, but it, it's, it's, uh, it's, some, it's something I think most people now are really understanding. I, I think the media is the most popular subject now right across the country. Mm -hmm. Whenever I, <coughs> excuse me, do public meetings, or whatever, what they want to talk about is the media and propaganda. And I think that the, the, the I think it's out. And mm -hmm. this, this election in which those, in which the mail devoted 13 pages of denigration of Jeremy Corbyn mm -hmm. a few days before the election were ignored Mm. Uh, the sun was ignored, mm. and all the rest of the propaganda was ignored. I think people are on to it. Mm. So hopefully things have changed and things will, will yes. continue to change. Yes. John, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the spot. You've got to come on again soon and we can continue this discussion. Very the, welcome. The Thank you. After the break, we get serious about Syria. Stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome back to Sputnik, with me, Neil Clark, standing in for George and Gatry. This week, the United Nations said that the US-led coalition airstrikes on Raqqa in Syria had led to a staggering loss of civilian life. The US has also admitted to using white phosphorus, a chemical weapon, but the media reaction in the West has been muted, to say the least. It's all a far cry from the headlines when Syrian forces, with Russian support, were trying to liberate Aleppo in December. Then, the talk was of a Holocaust taking place. Joining me now to discuss these glaring double standards is the journalist Vanessa Beely, who has visited and reported from Syria several times during the current conflict. Vanessa, a very warm Hello. welcome Good uh, to be on here. board the Sputnik. Thank you. Uh, you've been in Syria several times, haven't you, during the conflict? And in December, when the uh, liberation of Aleppo was taking place, yeah. you were there, weren't you? And the headlines here at the time were that this was a holocaust, this was yeah. a genocide, we, we had to intervene to stop this. What was the reality? on the ground. It was extraordinary. It was an extraordinary time because being on the ground there, um, mm. both in August during the heat of some of the battles um, to the south mm. of the city of Aleppo um, by the Syrian army to regain ground that had been taken by the various extremist and militant factions. And then basically being in East Aleppo, 
during the liberation of the various districts of East Aleppo, mm. um, watching events unfold on the ground, speaking to people as they emerged from what was effectively a five-year occupation mm. um, by Nusra front-led, so Al-Qaeda-led and dominated extremist factions funded, of course, by yeah. our governments and the Gulf states and yeah. equipped by Turkey, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then to, to be witnessing events on the ground, to be witnessing the celebrations of the people at mm. their liberation, um, to be seeing um, the care that the Syrian Arab army and uh, its Russian allies were taking to provide the humanitarian corridors to evacuate civilians mm. from districts prior to going in and, and basically cleansing them of the various terrorist factions. Um, and then to hear this almost sort of parallel dimension going yeah, on yeah. outside of Syria, yeah, um, amplified of debate, by yeah. our media, by the UN, by NATO-aligned NGOs, and as you said, by the government in Britain. I mean, it was sort of, it was quite extraordinary. There was one particular story that broke while I was there, um, which was the story of um, the Syrian women in a particular district about to commit mass suicide because the Syrian Arab army yeah. were going to rape them. Yeah. or that the Syrian Arab army were attacking their own civilians. One, I was there and I was on the ground mm. and, and, and there was absolutely no evidence of this. There was mm. sheer jubilation from um, the people of Syria to be liberated from this terrorist mm. occupation. But also um, something that people just don't seem to understand is that the Syrian Arab army is the Syrian people. Mm. It comes from the Syrian families. Yeah, and many and of Shia them, yeah, and sects, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And many of them were coming back to their homes mm. in East Aleppo. Mm. So this was one of the most obscene, grotesque distortions of truth mm. that I've ever actually sort of been able to witness firsthand. I mean, and plus, you know, you, we're talking here um, a Muslim society to even suggest that women in this society would en masse commit suicide shows a clear lack of understanding of that mm. society at its, itself. So, I mean, mm. it, yeah, it was extraordinary. It was sort of um, completely twilight zone, to be honest. And now we've got Raqqa, <laughs> haven't we, yeah. with the UN coming out talking about staggering loss of civilian life. It's incredible to see the lack of media coverage about this and contrast yeah. it with Aleppo. When we it was headlines, it was the headlines of the news. This one is tucked away on page 16, isn't it? It's Inside, extraordinary, isn't literally. it? Literally. I mean, when you have um, a nation and its army and its state defending itself against an illegal intervention mm. of proxy terrorist armies and brigades mm. um, committing atrocities against human beings mm. inside Syria, against civilians, not against uh, the regime or against the army, but mm. not against military uh, targets, but actually almost universally against civilians. Mm purely because collectively they've, they've resisted this intervention. So it's collective punishment mm. of the civilian population, which is ignored by the mm. media. Um, but when you have uh, an army that is defending its country, that is recapturing its homeland from these, these terrorist proxies, um, it's described, as you quite rightly said, mm. as, as Guernica or as Dresden yeah. or as a Holocaust or as a war crime. In, isn't it? You know, it, it, and, and the media... You know, and this is where, it, where it's criminal, and we were just talking about it in the green room. It, they leave no space for any political or diplomatic dialogue. They amplify it to such an extent that there is no recourse except military action, mm. military intervention. Mm. It's criminal. But then you see the US coalition dropping good bombs, yeah. you know, <laughs> on Mosul. Humanitarian for bombs. Yeah, humanitarian, you know, totally targeted bombs mm. on, on Mosul. And, of course, then civilians suddenly are described as collateral damage, mm. whereas the US coalition in Mosul have not provided any humanitarian mm. corridors. They've not provided yeah. any humanitarian assistance. And equally in Raqqa, yeah. we're seeing the use of chemical weapons, uh, white phosphorus. Mm. But it's very important to mention that the, the US has also admitted to using depleted uranium throughout Syria, mm. as it has in every nation. Yeah. Uh, that has been a prey nation that it's attacked. Yugoslavia, for example. Yeah, yep, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yep. You know, we've we've just had a report come out recently in the last couple of days. But mm. they've used deple depleted uranium. They've admitted mm. to using it. I have testimony from Syrian Arab Army soldiers on the ground of dreadful mm. effects of depleted uranium bullets and grenades wow. and missiles. Yeah. Um, and here we have the use of white phosphorus in Raqqa against a civilian population. Why? 
because it's effectively aiding their proxy on the ground, mm. uh, the SDF. Mm. which consists, of course, of, of the Kurdish uh, militants. And I have to make a very important point here that many Kurds in Syria support the Syrian state, support the Syrian army, and, and they don't want mm. uh, the Democratic Federation of, of <laughs> Kurdistan. Yeah. Um, but these Kurdish militants that are being aided and abetted by the U.S. coalition, and effectively what we're seeing is an ethnic cleansing of Raqqa. We have to be very clear of this. Wow. Over 50% mm. of the population has been driven out over the last few months, but of course now in a more um, deliberate and intensified way by the US coalition bombing campaign. Not only white phosphorus, but intense bombing campaign. Mm -hmm. And you know, we're hearing reports of 300 being killed, but we know how the UN manipulates mm -hmm. figures to serve various geopolitical purposes. So we can mm -hmm. assume that those figures are conservative. Mm. Isn't it fair to say that the whole way the Syrian conflict has been portrayed in much of the Western media has been totally false? Yes. Uh, is that going to, yeah, because, you know, it's been portrayed as a wicked, evil dictator who's waging war against his own people. He has no support in the country. He's just trying to cling on to power. Yeah. And we've got moderate rebels and all the... Yeah, there might be a few nasty, over-the-top characters, but they're moderate rebels. I know what yeah, David... Remember right. David Cameron's speech when he said how many there were? Thousands of... 70,000. 70,000 moderate yeah, rebels. Which came from Charles Lister, yeah. of course. You know. Yeah. Quite. So isn't it an argument for saying that there's the way the whole conflict has been presented has been false and that... I don't think I've ever, perhaps because, um, you know, Syria mm. is such a unified secular state and basically 80% of that population, if not more during, during this period of, mm. of intervention, support the Syrian state and the Syrian army. I mean, let's be very clear, there's still opposition members and there are still opposition on the ground in mm. Syria that do not necessarily approve of the government, but they're supporting the government in its resistance against mm. imperialism, neocolonialism, mm. and an attempt to, to both carve up Syria, destabilize Syria, and plunder Syria, mm. as they've done in, in Libya and Iraq, of course. Mm. And yeah, I mean, Aleppo, uh, to me, exemplified exactly what I call the 80-20 rule. You know, 80% of the population in West Aleppo, 1.5 million, the majority, were ignored by our media. 80% of the population in Syria living inside Syrian government-held mm. areas mm. are ignored. Mm. The 20% that are living, unfortunately for them, in terrorist-occupied areas, let's forget the moderate rebel myth, yeah. because I think that has pretty much been eradicated, yeah. Yeah. you know, conclusively. Yeah. Um, but that 20% living in terrorist-held areas are being used as human shields. They're being deprived of humanitarian and medical aid. They're being starved, they're being executed, mm. they're being imprisoned, they're being raped, they're being, um, you know, tortured. Mm. Um, and so it's, 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 it's an incredible situation where in reality what our media is, is basing its narrative upon are its sources on the ground, very few of them are on the ground inside mm. Syria, and they're basing their narrative upon sources that are clearly and undeniably affiliated to the extremist factions, mm. as but, in East Aleppo. Well, let's talk about these white helmets, then, <laughs> because I know you've done a lot of research and work on this. They yeah. were built up as this wonderful group. They were nominated for Nobel Peace Prizes, etc. Mm. And they are, you know, overwhelmingly presented as wonderful humanitarians in Syria, helping people. But yeah. your, your uh, version is rather different. Your, <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, I know we have very limited time, so yeah. I'll try and condense yeah. it. Um, look, basically, um, they're a propaganda shadow state construct created primarily and funded primarily by the UK through the Conflict, Stability and Security Fund. Yeah, there's a lot of funding for the UK, isn't it? I was really Over happy. 65 million. 65 million. Uh, yeah. And that's without... And, and Amber Rudd is very sort of uh, close-mouthed close on this. It's, mm. it's the secret Conflict, Stability and Security Fund, let's say. Mm. But what I would like to emphasise is that on my latest trip to Aleppo, I had the opportunity to go into the abandoned White Helmet centres when they had fled, wow. okay. not with the civilians, but with Nusra Front to Idlib. They're mm. now in Idlib with their various extremist factions. And what we found was a very clear um, alignment between Nusra Front and the White Helmets. Not only did they share mm. the same buildings in many of the centres, um, they okay. shared the same practices. People, civilians, told us on, on almost mm. a daily basis that uh, the White Helmets were working alongside Nusra Front. They were Nusra Front civil defence. They did not help civilians. They stole from the civilians. Wow. But they also participated mm. in various imprisonments and executions.
of those civilians. We've seen a recent uh, film come out from Dara in the south of Syria where they have effectively yet again mopped up after, after an extrajudicial execution carried out okay. by the terrorist factions there. Yeah. Um, and they were cheering this execution, so they cannot be deemed as, as humanitarian. Mm. Um, basically, it's a humanitarian construct that creates camouflage um, and protection for the terrorist mm. atrocities, and both factions are being funded by our governments. Thank you so much. Vanessa for coming on the Sputnik and, and uh, telling us what's really going on in Syria. Thank you. Well, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for this week on the Sputnik. George and Gatch will be back next time. But I'd like to thank everyone for watching these last few weeks and the great guests we've had on the programme too. You know what? It's been marvellous.